So good morning. Let's get uh, started. I'd like to continue today our discussion on the electric potential. Remember we defined yesterday the electric potential difference between two points in an electrostatic field as this expression here uh, where we have this uh, path integral, line integral from point one to point two not of electric field along this path, but minus of that. And the physical meaning is that this potential difference is work done per unit charge. So you can imagine this expression being multiplied and divided by a charge Q. That now forms within the expression the electric force QE and therefore that integral uh, gains a physical meaning. It's the work that is done by that force. Which force? Not the Coulomb force, QE, but minus QE. Just like in gravity, when you want to raise the potential energy of an object, you need to push it against the gravitational field. If you let uh, the chalk fall on the ground, then its potential energy reduces. It's exactly the same thing here. And this path integral is actually independent of the path that you will take. So if we try to apply this definition in these uh, fields, in the electrostatic field generated within a capacitor, we had calculated this before. I have calculated that with Gauss's law as well in an example that I have posted on the website. That electric field for a constant charge density rho s equal to rho s naught on the top and rho s equal to minus rho s naught at the bottom, so we have a positive and a negative charge density like we have in a capacitor, the electric field would be that constant charge density divided by epsilon naught, the constant that we have called the dielectric permittivity of free space. Uh, that is uh, 8.8542 uh, uh, times 10 to minus 12. So that is the electric field. So let's take now two points within the capacitor and find their potential difference, what we call uh, more uh, commonly the voltage. So what is the voltage between those two? The great thing about this uh, expression being path independent is that I can choose the path in order to trivialize the integral. If you find yourselves doing complex calculations, you have chosen the wrong path. This, uh, the cal this calculation should always be trivial. And, uh, any uh, proposals on which path to follow? So I have x1, y1, z1, x2, y2, z2. It's very hard to visualize on the board the three-dimensional um, view of this, but uh, imagine this is one point, this is the other point. So what path should I choose? Yeah, go ahead. Right. Parallel, but going just parallel is not enough because I cannot get, if I go just parallel, I won't get to this point. So I can either go perpendicular or parallel, not at an angle. At an angle will make my calculation difficult. So to go from one to two in a way that will trivialize this definition, I will first move along the x-axis. So this is one, this is two. First, I move along the x-axis, so I go to x2, y1, z1, let me call this point A. Then I go along the y-axis, and I reach now the point x2, y2, z2. And now the final path will be from this to this. So you see two of my three paths, let me call this point B. Okay. Two of my three paths are perpendicular to the electric field lines. So in the integral will give me zero. And therefore, if I apply this definition, potential difference between those two points, the electric field here is this one. DL. 
I split this integral in, two, in three parts. Of course, I do it now only because we present it um, as an introduction to this technique, but from one point on, you should be able to do this immediately. Just go directly. Yes? Is the second point supposed to be x2, y2, z1? Uh, z1, yes, thank you. Thank you, yes, this is a typo, z1, yeah. Okay, so uh, here I have minus and minus. That will become plus. And now I go from 1 to A. Along this path, I'm moving along the x-axis. So therefore, my DL is x dx. Now I go from A to B. So from A to B, I move along the y-axis. So my DL is y dy. And then finally, from B to 2, I'm moving along the z-axis. So this is my DL is z hat dz. So many times, at this point, I'm asked, you are moving downwards. Why do you put dz and, mi and not minus dz? OK, anybody has an answer to this question? Is this for the voltage? Yeah, it is for the voltage. Is it moving against the direction of the electric field? Because they are opposite charges. So right, but uh, so what I'm, the question that I'm being asked many times is that in this path, I'm moving to the negative z-axis. So why do you put here z hat dz and not minus z hat dz? What's that? Forget about the voltage, it's an integral, right? What did your calculus teacher tell you? Yes, uh, sorry, he was first, I think. Anyway, go ahead, let's. Minus minus. Sorry, you didn't raise your hand. I'm trying to regulate uh, here the, the traffic. Yeah, go ahead. The bounds take care of the negative. That's right. dz is an algebraic quantity already. So if you put a minus here, you will account for the same thing twice. So you will end up with uh, the wrong result. So you see here clearly what this path uh, independence has done for us and our choice. Z dot y, z dot y is zero, z dot x is zero. So you only have something from here. The integration is done with respect to z only. So this is a trivial integral dz from b to 2. So it is, as your classmate pointed out, I had a, a typo before. So it is from z1 to z2. So basically, the potential difference, rho s over epsilon naught, z2 minus z1. So that's the one. Okay. We talked about reference points yesterday, about how you can now take this potential difference and define potential, actual potential. Uh, so, any proposals where we could put the reference point? So, to define electric potential, not potential difference. Not delta V, not potential difference. We need a reference point. So this reference point, always depending on the structure, is chosen in a way that will facilitate our calculations. Any ideas where you would put here the reference point? Where? So an easy uh, place to put the reference point is right here. So you can put, uh, you can consider that v, v of z equal zero is zero. So that is uh, my choice. Remember. Only the potential difference has physical meaning. Once you have the potential difference, once you get a battery and it's 1.5 volts, it's up to you to say whether the negative pole is 0 and the positive is 1.5, or the negative pole is minus 1 and the other is um, 
plus 0.5 and so on. So this is totally up to you. So here it makes sense to choose, I could choose any point, I will choose z equals zero. So you see that here the uh, uh, potential difference depends only on z. So I set the reference at uh, zero. So then for any z2 now equal to z, any point within the capacitor, I can apply this formula I set this as a reference point to zero potential, and that gives me now rho s by epsilon naught times z. So this now is a potential function within uh, the capacitor uh, that, uh, as you see, varies linearly. So it, go, it starts from zero here and goes to rho s by epsilon naught times the height of the capacitor. So if this is the height and here we are at z equal zero and here we are at z equal h, then uh, you see that the voltage uh, at uh, this uh, plate will become rho s by epsilon naught h. So if this entire thing had been generated by a voltage source, so if I had charged the capacitor like this, the voltage source would control the potential difference and set it equal to some V0, 1.5 volts, 5 volts, 3 volts. So that means that right here the potential would be V0 and right here the potential would be 0 by my convention that I put uh, the lower electrode as my reference plane or the reference point. Um, so you see in this case V0 which is rho s by epsilon naught times h would give you this equation which is very convenient in a capacitor so since we encounter it here I will just put it on the board that rho s by epsilon naught is equal to V over V0 over h so you can express the electric field in the capacitor this is a formula that we have that you probably have seen before that the electric field in the capacitor, its magnitude is voltage divided by the separation between the plates. So voltage divided by separation between the plates is the electric field within a capacitor. We talked about equipotential surfaces, surfaces where the potential remains constant. Those are uh, perpendicular to the electric field and you see that this would look like planes within the capacitor. So these are the equipotential surfaces in the case of the capacitor because if you fix z you fix the potential. The potential only depends on z. So for points that have the same z the potential will be the same. So that's why we call those the assembly of those points that would be planes as equipotential surfaces. So this concludes my first example. Any questions? Questions? Okay. Uh, second example of another field that we had uh, seen before. Uh, it is the field of uh, the line charge distribution. Rosa Bell along the z-axis. We had seen that this field in cylindrical coordinates is rho L by 2 epsilon naught R, 2 pi epsilon naught R, R hat. So this is a field that points this way and diminishes away from the axis. So again, I will apply this uh, definition to find the potential difference between two points, one and two,
one at a distance r1 <coughs> and another at a distance r2. So my 1 is at r1 phi 1 z1, uh, point 2 is at r2 phi 2 z2. So again, it's up to me to choose the path that I will go from 1 to 2. And uh, here it's, it's also somewhat difficult to visualize the motion along the circle to change my phi angle from phi 1 to phi 2. But you can imagine that I can go along this circle here, go from phi 1 to phi 2, then move to up along the z-axis and then go along this straight line from uh, this point, let me call it 1 prime, to 2. To, uh, to two. So this point 1 prime is at r1 phi 2 z2, so I can move now along a straight line uh, from 1 prime to 2. So I want to repeat or maybe I can very quickly repeat the process with the other two integrals. You see again the idea is exactly the same. So I will turn around to make the phi coordinates the same. Then I will go up to make the z coordinates the same. And now that I have same phi and z, I will just move along the radial direction. So V21 is split into one integral and uh, here it is a little bit difficult to see, but what I'm doing is I'm starting from point one and I go around the circle so that from coordinate phi one I go to coordinate phi two. So this will be, this DL, the corresponding DL, will be given by phi hat r d phi. So here I'm moving in the uh, angular direction. And then I will move also in the z direction. Z dz. So all these dl's, you can find them in your age sheet. And the point here is that both of them will be 0. So again, I'm just uh, showing all these things from, for tutorial purposes. Uh, you could right away go and say that that's how the integral will look like. And finally, only the last one will matter. R dr. And now that uh, dr will vary from R1 to R2. And uh, r dot r is 1. Again, the integral becomes trivial to calculate. And it is, let me change here. And it is equal to minus rho L by 2 pi epsilon naught uh, dr from r1 to r2. Uh, sorry, I forgot an R here. I need to put it in. So it is uh, dr over R. So this is a, a, um, an integral of 1 over R that gives you the logarithm. So we have minus rho L by 2 pi epsilon naught logarithm of R2 minus logarithm of R1.
or if you wish, rho L by 2 pi epsilon naught logarithm of R1 over R2. So this is the, uh, the result. So you see that as you move along the field, away from the field, the potential will be uh, decreasing as you would expect. So here I absorb this minus sign by inverting the argument of the uh, logarithm. So ln of uh, a over b is minus ln over uh, b over a. So that is the result. So here you see an example where, or let me ask you this question, where would you take here the reference point? You see the potential only depends on r, the distance from the axis. So here the equipotential surfaces are cylinders. So these are the equipotential surfaces. Whenever you are fixing R, you are defining a cylinder. And now the equipotentials are cylinders. And the potential decreases along the direction of the field. As you would expect, the closer you go to the charge, the higher your potential. Because imagine that you wanted to push a positive charge towards the axis. You would need to put in a lot of work because you are getting a lot of repulsion from the line charge density. And that's why the potential should actually increase as you go towards the charge. If you go away from the charge, the potential decreases without you doing any work because it just uh, feels a repulsion from the charge density. And that's why the potential decreases away. You want to, yeah, go ahead. Me? Yeah. So can I do that? Wouldn't that get you a value that your voltage there would be zero? But you see, the problem is that if I put, let's say, R2 to infinity or R1 to infinity, I have them inside the logarithm and I'm in trouble. So that will give me an expression that I cannot use. So here you see a case where actually putting the reference point to infinity, by the way, even in the case of the capacitor, we didn't put it at infinity, we put it on that uh, z equals zero, which extends all the way to infinity. But this one is an example where actually this choice would not work. So the choice of reference point at infinity does not work generally for infinite charge densities. If you have a point charge, as we saw in the previous lecture, that works. If you have collections of point charges, as we will see in another example, it does work. As long as this collection of point charges is within a finite area. So. I gave you this example precisely to emphasize that we cannot take here the reference point So you see, all these, either the choice of the path or the choice of a reference point are choices that we make to make our expressions easier to use. So here, if I set R2 to infinity, then I wouldn't be able to use the expression because it would diverge to infinity. So the expression is still good, but it's not useful because it gives me numbers that I cannot use. It will tell me that the potential is minus infinity, minus infinity, minus infinity, minus infinity, and that doesn't tell me anything. So where do I take the reference point? Anywhere anywhere at any finite distance from the charge distribution. So uh, you can imagine that this is the field of a power line and you set the potential to the ground equal to zero. So if uh, this is like a power line, then you can set the potential here to zero at a distance equal to the height of the power line. So where to set the reference point? That is up to us. But it has to be finite. So let me call it R0. Then by convention, if I set R2 equal to some general R, R1 to R0, 
Then the formula I just derived looks like this. So I set this by convention to zero, and that gives me rho L by 2 pi epsilon naught uh, ln R naught by R. And R naught is my choice. It can be 3 meters, 4 meters, 5 meters. It cannot be zero. It cannot be infinity. So practical situation, field of a power line, potential of a power line. If you want to uh, define a reference for the potential, put it on the ground. And then your distance will be the distance of the power line from the ground. So this is the, a practical um, situation where you would choose it. So I'd like to make a note here of a general rule that we can take infinity as a reference point for finite charge distributions. So this problem that we saw here for uh, the line charge, we would encounter it in uh, any other infinite charge distributions that we would deal with. And always, you, can, you have to choose, in these cases, some other reference point. If you had, on the other hand, let's say, a charged ring, or a charged disk, or a charged plate that is finite, let's say. All these things, or a charged sphere, just to So all these are examples of finite charge distributions for which we can take the reference point to infinity. So sphere, plate, another uh, disk. So in all these cases, finite charge distributions, there is no problem take the reference point to infinity. But for infinite, that doesn't work. You just have to make another choice. It's all about choices. So any questions? All right. So remember why we care about potential altogether. It is because we can actually determine electric field from the potential. So I'd like to repeat something I said uh, yesterday. Uh, moving now to or coming back. Uh, to the relation between electric field and potential. From the definition of the electric potential difference, which is this, okay? And if I move this minus sign inside here, you notice that actually this potential difference is built up dV by dV along the DL segments. So you see this uh, looks is a path integral and I go DL by DL and I build this potential difference by integration. So this is the DL. It's tangential vectors along the path of integration. So this means that in fact there is a relationship between the differential of the potential as a function and the electric field. And that relation we can use and to start with, I recognize that these two are the same. Now, V, the way that we defined it, that is, after you calculate the differences and take a reference point, in which case you have now some V of x, y, z, 
is a function, like those that you saw in calculus. And what is the differential of a function? You do the following experiment. You change x by dx, you change y by dy, you change z by dz, and you measure the difference in the function. That difference will be, if you change x by dx, it will be given by this expression. If you change y by dy, it will be given by this. So these are the partial derivatives of v with respect to the, function, the uh, coordinates. And if you change z by dz, it will be this. And if you change all of them together, it will be the sum of those. But on the other hand, I have also an electric field that generally has three components. And I'm using the Cartesian coordinates just for convenience. And I have a DL that also has three components in general. Of course, I'm smart enough to not go along paths where all three components are needed. But in general, DL would have these three components, x dx plus y dy. So if you go to your aid sheet, you will see these are the three vectors. Just put them all together. And that gives you the general expression for DL, correct? Just all of them in the blender. So E dot DL then, if you take the dot product, and in fact, I don't have E dot DL, I have minus of that, will give me minus EX DX, minus EY DY, minus EZ DZ. And that now means that these two expressions will be the same. And look at the multiplier here of dx, which is, and the multiplier of dx in this expression. So those two have to be equal because the expressions are equal. dx, dy, dz vary arbitrarily. So that means that the multipliers of dx, dy, dz in the two expressions have to be equal to each other. So theta y by theta z has to be equal to minus ey. Theta v by theta z has to be equal to minus ez. So then I have that ex is minus theta v by theta x. Ey is minus theta v by theta y. Ez is minus theta v by theta z. And this can be written in one shot in a compact expression as electric field equals to minus gradient of the potential. You see, this is a big deal because gradient is an operator that maps a scalar quantity to a vector. That means that I can go around in a circuit, for example, or in the microwave oven, if I'm interested in doing this calculation, or in any other structure where there is a charge distribution, measure potentials, or in human tissues, in the brain, like we do in ECG. And then from potential, I can find actually the electric field with this recipe. So this is an engine for calculating the electric field, both theoretically and experimentally. The experimental part, I don't go into that much. You are familiar with voltmeters. So in principle, you know that I can uh, go in a circuit, I can go in a structure that uh, contains charge distributions or is subject to fields from charge distributions like the electric circuit and measure the potential and from the potential I can reconstruct the field. But these days there is a lot of interest in uh, simulators, in software, and uh, AI-powered or non-AI-powered, hardware accelerated as well. Uh, you may have seen the activity by NVIDIA, for example, for uh, hardware accelerated um, simulations, computational physics, varying from electromagnetics to fluid dynamics, to optimization of uh, wings in aeroplanes, to weather predictions. So there is a lot of interest for uh, these things. So here, what we can do with the potential is we can actually set up an equation, a boundary value problem that we can solve for the potential, 
with uh, a solver of differential equations and then from that find the field. And this is actually a very powerful way that is commonly used in simulators for electrostatic fields. What is the relevant equation? That is what we call the Poisson equation. So here is the Poisson equation, and I hope to uh, do an example, uh, which is about setting up a boundary value problem for the potential, so that I can solve the potential and from the potential find the field. So the Poisson equation starts from the electric field being equal to minus gradient of V. And I'm writing out the operators instead of using the del because many times people confuse the del and the uh, gradient and so on. So I will just write them out so that you don't confuse them. The electric field, though, satisfies Gauss's law. So Gauss' law says that the divergence of the electric field, and still I have not done dielectrics yet, so therefore the only place where I can cast this law is free space. So for now, that's all in free space. Divergence of the electric field is volume charge density divided by epsilon naught. Volume charge density. Just to remind you this notation. So now, if I replace the electric field with this expression, I have a differential equation with respect to the voltage. And that will be divergence of the gradient of V equals to rho V by epsilon naught. So you see this is a differential equation now that the voltage satisfies. And it's called the Poisson equation. The combination of uh, divergence and gradient, so you see gradient maps, and this is important also for your lab, um, gradient maps a scalar to a vector. Really big deal because you measure a scalar, you use the gradient, you get a vector. The divergence does the opposite. It's not a school, but still works for Gauss's law. So maps a vector to a scalar. So you see, you take this vector, the electric field, you apply the divergence, you get something that doesn't have direction. It's just the volume charge density in Coulomb per meter cubed. So the combination of divergence and gradient is called the Laplacian. And the symbol for this is uh, del squared. Now, since this operator is called the Laplacian, it is fair to actually give a name to the equation that is uh, related to Laplace. And indeed, for empty spaces, when rho v is zero, that is if you don't have volume charge density, as in the example I'm about to solve, then the equation becomes Laplacian of v is equal to zero and is called the Laplace equation. So I saw a a question on uh, Piazza, where do I use Poisson, when, when do I use Laplace? Uh, it's, uh, the answer is straightforward, that uh, the Laplace equation is the Poisson equation when you don't have any volume charge density. So this is now what the mathematicians call a boundary value problem uh, for the voltage that you can solve. And then once you solve, uh, you find the electric field. So I will give you an example where I will do exactly that. And this example will be a very uh, familiar structure, which is the coaxial cable. So here is a coaxial cable. It's uh, two cylinders.
one inside the other. Usually those have a dielectric in between. Now uh, I will just put air in between, no big deal. So the inner cylinder has radius A, the outer cylinder has radius B. And uh, this uh, is the Z axis, just to give it a coordinate system. So the cable runs along the Z axis. So I'm uh, feeding this cable with a voltage source, V0. I'm grounding the outer cylinder. So I'm setting this way, I'm setting this way the potential in the inner cylinder to be V0 and the potential in the outer cylinder to be zero. <clears throat> so the boundary value problem that I have consists of an equation. You see here, we are in the domain of the Laplace equation because there is no volume charge density. I have those two cables. They are thin conductors. So they can support themselves surface charge densities. That's not what the Poisson equation is talking about. The Poisson equation is talking about clouds. Things like the ionosphere where you have, or a, a charge sphere, where you have a volume distribution of charges. In this case, I don't have volume distribution of charges. In between the conductors where I'm interested to find the potential, there is just free space. Look at this. There is no volume. So the voltage, satisfies the Laplace equation. This is a cylindrically symmetric structure. So therefore, I will go and apply the Laplace equation or the Laplacian in cylindrical coordinates. Okay, so in cylindrical coordinates, If you go to your aid sheet, you will see that the expression for the Laplacian looks like this. 1 over r, theta by theta r. And again, we need to simply be patient and just copy over the expressions. 1 over r squared theta squared v by theta phi squared plus theta squared v by theta z squared. Okay, so that's how it will look like, the Laplacian. However, you already know, or we have seen similar structures to this. For example, we just saw the power line, right, which is a cylindrically symmetric structure. Is this structure cylindrically symmetric? Yes, because it's just two cylinders. Uh, whatever is, uh, consists of cylinders is cylindrically symmetric. So what do we know about cylindrically symmetric structures? I have already the field here from the previous one. Can the potential or the fields depend on phi? How about z? I, of course, this is a finite, this has to be a finite cable, but for the time being, I consider it as infinite. So I find fields and potentials far away from the feeding uh, points. So therefore, by cylindrical symmetry, The potential can only, and the fields as well, can only depend on the radial coordinate, and hence these two are zero. And hence the Laplace equation is one over r. Now I don't put partials anymore because I know that the voltage depends only on r equals to zero. So then you see one over r cancels out and I have 
d, uh, uh, d by dr of this equal to zero. This is again easy to solve. That means that r dv by dr is equal to a constant. So dv by dr is equal to c1 over r. And now I have one more integration to do. dv by dr is c1 over r. That means that the potential itself, v, will be c1 logarithm of r plus c2. So I have now a boundary value problem. And the integration gives me these constants. You have a question? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Oh, OK. Um, no. Is there ever the case when we're going to have some sort of uh, cylindrical you know, shape, the dielectric, where it has axial symmetry instead of like no radial symmetry? Like field line? Uh, say that again. Uh, you have Uh, so here, the phi symmetry can be broken if you put, uh, let's say, different dielectrics in this direction. But otherwise, you have full cylindrical symmetry. Okay. I don't know if I'm answering your question. But. No, no, that's good. Okay, so this is the potential. And I can use the boundary uh, conditions to determine the constants. So I know that C1 logarithm of A plus... Uh, C2 is equal to V0 and C1 logarithm of B plus C2 is equal to 0. So if I subtract those two, I get C1 logarithm of A minus logarithm of B equals to V0. So that gives me the first constant. And then I can go back here and find the second constant as well. And at this point, I have solved the problem. And I have found the potential, not by running integrals. The subtle point here is that before, I found the potential difference as well. OK? So someone may say, OK, who cares? I can do the other method as well. But the other method needs the field, right? Because I run e dot dl. This one, I can take a PDE solver, a, part, a differential equation solver from MATLAB or from any other package, throw in this equation, I get the potential out. And this is the power of uh, this, uh, this method. So now if I uh, take the C1 that I found, and uh, put it in the first expression, c1 times logarithm of, uh, or I'll put it in the second expression, which is a little bit easier, logarithm of b plus c2 is equal to 0. I have found c2 as well. Okay. So I put everything together, and I have the potential in this case, uh, C1 times logarithm of R plus C2 And with some massage, you know that ln, ln of x minus ln y is ln of x over y. I can cast this in a somewhat more compact form, ln of a over b, ln of r over b. So this is the potential throughout this. And then I can find the electric field as well. The electric field. So you see here, I have solved the entire thing only knowing the boundary values of the voltage that I set myself by putting the source in and the structure. So I don't need to know the field ahead of time to do the calculation. So the electric field is minus gradient 
of V. In cylindrical coordinates, this is minus theta V of uh, theta R, R hat. You know now that this is not a partial derivative anymore. It's a full derivative because the potential depends only on R. And you see, I have, don't go and do the derivative over there. We have it already here, that dv over dr. It's c1 over r. So I take the expression for c1. And I have the uh, 1 over r here. So this is the electric field. Minus v naught ln a over b. Uh, R. And of course, A is smaller than B, is smaller than B. So if you uh, write ln of A over B, this is a negative number with a minus sign gives you a positive number. So I can make this a little bit more intuitive by switching the signs here and here. Just so that you see that indeed the electric field points in the direction of decreasing potential from the positive electrode to the negative electrode. So this is the electric field. Okay. So hopefully this gives you an idea of how we can solve full problems by using this uh, Poisson-Laplace equation and the potential. So thanks for your attention. I'll stick around for any questions since we're out of time. <laughs>